In the last video, we looked at how nuclear energy is vastly more space efficient than renewables, and whilst some forms of renewable energy, such as tidal, hydroelectric and heliostats, are pretty good and should be built when possible, they certainly cannot do the job on their own due to their usage being limited to the geography of a nation. In my opinion, they belong in the same category as energy efficiency measures in general. They can at best limit the total number of nuclear reactors that Europe needs, but nevertheless, Europe will still need nuclear reactors. Despite these realities, people often fall for three major misconceptions. One, nuclear waste is an unsolved problem. Two, nuclear power is too expensive. And three, a more recent myth, nuclear power is too slow to build. As you're about to see, these claims, or at least the rebuttals to them, are fairly intertwined. Part 1. How nuclear waste proves that nuclear energy is not too expensive. To deal with the first two misconceptions, we need to understand what a carcinogen is. This is what your DNA looks like. The basic blocks consist of a nucleoside, a sugar, and a phosphate and these are bonded together in long strands called genes. Genes are transcribed into temporary copies of messenger RNA, which are then translated into various proteins making up the cells of your body. But you don't need a high school biology lesson. What is important is that the system of gene expression is very tightly regulated as to prevent cells from accumulating mutations and turning cancerous. Any chemical that directly or indirectly interferes with regulation and gene expression is called a carcinogen. Think of them as coming in three flavours, radiotoxic, chemical and endocrine disruptor. Radiotoxic carcinogens come from nuclear waste. The various elements inside spent fuel rods give off radiation. If you stand near them, the radiation will excite molecular bonds within the cytoplasm of your cells, breaking them apart. This will lead to the formation of chemicals called reactive oxygen species. It is these chemicals that then attack DNA through oxidation, modifying the structure of nucleotides, leading to DNA strands breaking apart. However, this kind of damage is actually a very common occurrence. In fact, oxidative DNA damage occurs at least 10,000 times per cell per day in humans. Your body naturally produces reactive oxygen species through regular metabolism, the inflammatory response to disease, the consumption of certain food products, and of course, background radiation. As a result, life on Earth has evolved multiple repair mechanisms to rejoin broken DNA. What makes nuclear waste dangerous is the sheer amount of radiation and thus the sheer amount of reactive oxygen species. If the repair mechanisms are overwhelmed, the cell will undergo a form of programmed cell death called apoptosis. It is very much like when your skin peels away after getting sunburnt. But if damage occurs to the very genes that regulate repairing or shutting down the cell, it can cause mutations to accumulate, thus increasing the risk of cancer. Again, just like how excess sun exposure increases the risk of skin cancer. But is that a reason not to build new nuclear power stations? No, because the waste can be recycled or easily contained. A fuel rod is mostly uranium-238, which can't undergo fission, and a small amount of uranium-235, which can undergo fission. Fission splits uranium-235 into smaller atoms. These are called fission products, and they make up about 4% of the waste fuel rod. They are very radioactive because they are small atoms with too many neutrons. If you want a quick rundown on this, check out my video on how nuclear waste saves lives. Fission products are very easy to make safe. You simply vitrify them, meaning you convert them into glass so that they are unable to react with anything, preventing them from moving within the environment should they ever escape containment. After vitrification, they are wrapped in concrete to keep the radiation sealed within. Most fission products will lose half of their radioactivity every 30 years or less as they decay into stable elements and isotopes. The remainder of the waste fuel rod is mostly the original, non-fissionable uranium-238 and a very small amount of transuronic elements such as plutonium and americium, which are created by uranium-238 capturing neutrons and undergoing beta decay. These leftover elements, along with the residue uranium-235, are a mix of fissionable and fertile isotopes, which can be recycled back into more fuel. 
And after they've been reused, what's left over can also be vitrified, just like the fission products, and eventually buried in a deep geological repository. If the idea of burying nuclear waste scares you, know that Earth's crust is already radioactive. It is full of uranium, thorium, potassium, and radium, hence why it is still hot after 4.5 billion years. So, to bury the waste below the water table and return it to the rock cycle really isn't a problem. Yes, there have been accidents that released these radioactive elements into the environment, such as the Windscale Fire, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. These accidents have undoubtedly caused cancer. But the total number of deaths lays at around 9,500, the majority of which come from the Chernobyl disaster. Such an accident can never happen again, but that is a subject for another video. Now, 9,500 deaths is indeed terrible, but compare that to the global 8 million premature deaths that happen every single year due to poor air quality, and we can see that the scale of deaths from opposing nuclear energy is much, much worse. Which brings us to the second flavour, chemical carcinogens. Briefly, chemical carcinogens are much more diverse, as such they can attack DNA through more mechanisms. Nations that burn a large amount of coal are constantly adding chemical carcinogens to the air, a famous example being PM2.5, which causes oxidative damage, and a class of chemicals called atmospheric polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These will bind to DNA forming adducts, which disrupt the DNA replication process, leading to the loss of nucleobases and mismatches. Such damage can be repaired by cells, but sometimes the repair mechanisms fail. And because the air is constantly being pumped with these chemicals from fossil fuels, the number of mutations accumulates, thus increasing the likelihood of cells turning cancerous. We are going to talk about nuclear being too expensive for a moment. One country notorious for its hostility towards nuclear energy is Germany. After Chernobyl, they shut down some reactors, including one of the very few in the world that runs on the thorium cycle. Good job. But after the Fukushima accident in 2011, which killed one person, Germany began to shut down the majority of its nuclear power stations and has tried to entirely replace them with renewable energy. As far as I can tell, Germany spends around 20 billion euros on renewable subsidies every year and by 2025, annual subsidies spent on renewable energy are estimated to total 520 billion euros. Think about that. Despite spending enough money to build 20 new nuclear reactors, the reality of intermittent energy has meant that a considerably large amount of Germany's energy capacity comes from coal. All that money spent on renewable energy and Germany's CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour is six times worse than that of France, a nation with 56 nuclear reactors. So much for nuclear being too expensive. Unfortunately, Germany throwing hundreds of billions of euros at renewables and failing to replace nuclear energy is not the only problem. Partially replacing nuclear with coal has been estimated to prematurely kill 1,100 people every year due to local pollution. Not only is that terrible in of itself, but the increased mortality risks are estimated to cost the German healthcare system up to 8 billion euros per year. That is almost enough to build a new nuclear reactor every year and not have people die. Yet Greenpeace tells you that nuclear energy is too expensive and dangerous. Clearly opposing nuclear energy is much more dangerous and much more expensive. Just let that sink in for a moment. An entire nation was afraid of radiotoxic carcinogens, so they shut down all of their nuclear reactors and replaced them with energy systems that pump chemical carcinogens into the air. <sighs> Damn. Now, let's move on to the final flavour, endocrine disruptors. The more powerful a wind turbine, the larger the blades, and as such they have to be made from very tough materials. However, over their lifetimes the leading edges erode, they become less efficient and they have to be replaced. And because they are made with thermosetting epoxies and glass fibre, they cannot be remoulded, making the raw materials not impossible but difficult to recycle. Therefore, they are usually cut up and buried. How eco-conscious. The erosion of the leading edges means that all those giant offshore wind turbines and many onshore wind turbines are leaking their materials into the environment. 
The negative effects of these materials on mammalian health are quite diverse, but for the sake of this video we shall focus on their carcinogenicity. Endocrine disruptors don't directly attack DNA, but instead interfere with the signalling in and between cells of the body. On the left is estradiol. When this naturally occurring hormone binds to receptors on the surface of cells, it will cause an internal signal cascade leading to the expression of genes related to cellular division. As such, the amount of this hormone is carefully regulated by various feedback loops. On the right is bisphenol A, or BPA for short. It is a carcinogen used in the epoxy coating of wind turbine blades. Due to its chemical structure being similar to estradiol, it can act in a similar manner within the body. As you can see from this diagram of a cell surface, it can bind to membrane estrogen receptors and epidermal growth factor receptor. BPA can also cross the membrane into the cell interior. As a result of the receptor binding, signaling cascades and genes are upregulated much more than they should be. The excessive cellular division causes genetic and epigenetic mutations to accumulate within the new cells. Not only can this lead to cancer, it also promotes angiogenesis and the production of matrix metalloproteases. Angiogenesis, meaning the formation of new blood vessels, and metalloproteases are a class of secreted enzymes which break down the glue that usually holds cells together. And now, if cancer occurs, the tumour will have a fresh supply of blood and a way to escape the primary tumour. Because of these effects, BPA has been associated with many hormone and non-hormone dependent cancers. To summarise, we can see that the evidence is pretty damning. Not only has a reliance on renewable energy ultimately led to burning fossil fuels that pump carcinogens into the air, but to a very small extent, eroding wind turbines also contribute to the problem. They are by no means the only consumer of BPA. It is used in many plastics, and it does biodegrade quite quickly. There is just a lot of it. In 2013, wind turbine blades accounted for 69,000 tonnes of BPA-based epoxy resin sold in Europe alone, which was 27% of all production. That rose to 250,000 tonnes by 2015, and I assume that figure is still increasing today. But eroding wind turbines are still nowhere near as bad as coal, and when the wind is blowing, they are offsetting the burning of coal. But wouldn't it be better if coal was not burned at all? If only there was a solution to that dilemma. Let's move on. Part 2. The Too Slow Myth The reason I mention BPA in wind turbines is because it is very important for people to understand that all forms of energy generation and all human activity has a negative impact on nature. Therefore, we must choose forms of energy generation and transportation that have the lowest negative outcome. No matter what good Greenpeace may do elsewhere, they have been misinforming people for decades. When context is applied to their criticisms of nuclear energy, the supposed weaknesses are apparently not very weak. Nuclear is not too expensive, it is not too dangerous, and despite their hyperfixation on delays with the latest reactors under construction, nuclear is not too slow. The average time to construct a nuclear power station is seven years, and the only reason that more recent projects in Europe are taking longer is because decades of experience and lessons learnt in the 20th century were lost. Take the UK for example. The backbone of their nuclear fleet is the advanced gas-cooled reactor. The first station, Dungeness B, took 18 years to complete due to a plethora of issues with a new design. Despite the setbacks, another 14 of these reactors were built in total and the final power station of this design was finished in just 8 years. The longer that infrastructure engineers are kept in employment, the more experienced and efficient they become. That is why the two EPR reactors built in Taishan, China, which are of the same design as Oikoloto, were finished in 9 years instead of 17. Unlike China, Europe hasn't built many nuclear power stations over the past three decades, and as such, a lot of experience has to be relearned. The UK's current fleet of reactors are reaching the end of their lifespan. One by one they are being shut down, and if they are not replaced, Britain could end up in the same situation as Germany. Furthermore, we need nuclear energy as part of a wider project of urban densification and the mass rollout of electrified public transport so that a cultural over-reliance on cars comes to an end. 
and all of those trolley buses, trams and trains will need a lot of electricity 24-7. And that is something nuclear energy can provide without breaking a sweat. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, why not leave a like and a comment? I have a further two videos on the subject of nuclear energy remaining. Yes, I know I said that in the last one, but I've had a few new ideas, so do consider subscribing. Also, if you wish to make a donation to my channel, there is a link to my Ko-Fi along with my sources for this video below in the description. Thank you again.